What up, Oasis what up? people? Hey, we're back. Uh, Another howdy. episode. Anybody have any clue what number this is? Uh, 115. Wow. 115. Look at us. Uh, it feels like we hit 100 like a long time ago. Well, well 15. 15 weeks ago. Well, more than 15 weeks ago. Well, yeah, we took, yeah. we took a couple Towers, breaks yeah. and kind of an inconsistent fall, but we're back. Woo, we're we're back. doing it, and we got another great podcast, so let's do this thing. You ready for this qu- question? I guess we'll see. What's the best thing you've ever made? Mm. You have one? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a pole bent. I don't know if it's the best thing I've ever made. Okay. <laughs> okay. Pole bent. Um, but I recently found oh, a recipe yeah. for um, Crumbles Classic yes. Sugar Cookie. Tried it. Was delicious. Very good. Hmm. Very good. Dylan, you're gonna have to go. I don't know if I have one for sure yet. Um, the best thing I think I made when I was growing up, I was fairly handy. Like I was always in the garage making something, mm. um, and I made out of just some scrap wood. I found I made I made an airport for my Lego room. Oh. And so I built like a two story airport. Wow. For my Legos. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. That is that is cool. That, that will make like mine look real bad. Dollhouse. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, called them it's out. Okay. <laughs> uh, have the one I'm thinking of is I was probably six, seven, real young, pre for sure old, less than ten, probably about seven or eight, <laughs> and I was making my mom a birthday present, and it was one of those. So essentially, I made the coupon book, you know, oh, the yep. classic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. one free hug. I'll take out the garbage, <laughs> whatever, whatever. I made that, but I didn't want to present it to her in a book. I thought that was boring. So I ended up making her a log cabin house, but I made it out of leftover cardboard that we'd okay. had at her house and the only box I could find. And at the at the time I was like, oh, this is this this will work great. It was an old <laughs> Mike's Hard Lemonade box. <laughs> <laughs> and so I okay. cut it and then I made like a little A-frame roof on it. And then I took popsicle sticks and just glued the crap out of this box <laughs> nice. with popsicle okay. sticks. So then when she wanted a coupon, she had to take the roof off. And she could get, Aww. and I don't, Interesting. to this day, I don't think she ever claimed a single <laughs> one of those coupons, but. What if she came back that. now and was like, Brennan. She doesn't remember. Hug. Cue Brennan's mom. When she listens through the to this, which I, she might, if you find the coupons, I'll, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> but only if you got a coupon. Not only if you got a coupon. Yeah. <laughs> Hugs don't come cheap nowadays, you know? Especially from you. Yeah. Yikes. Not a big hugger. All right. Well, let's anyway. get into it. Yeah. Anyways, um, today we're talking about creativity um, and how we can create out of our faith. Um, and so the first thing is when it comes to creativity, I think we all think it's pretty important. Mm. Um, it can get lost. There's some misconceptions around it. Um, and so we just want to spend some time talking about it because creativity is a huge part of our faith um, that in Genesis 1, the first thing that we know about God is that he's creator. Um and there's also some other stories throughout the uh, throughout the Bible, um, like Exodus 31. God pours His Spirit out on Bezalel, right? Sure. All right. I'm so we'll bad at it. names, <laughs> both in person and in the Bible. Bezalel uh, to equip him to make artistic designs. So God poured out the Holy Spirit pre Jesus in order to help B. I'm going to call him B. Um, <laughs> make art, and then in yeah. Exodus 35, four chapters later, God does the same to. Oh, Holab and uh, his mech. <laughs> <laughs> this is just go, go look up Exodus 31 and 35. Yeah, go read Exodus 1, yeah, there you go. 31 and 35. There it's you great. Go. You'll see the names yourself. <laughs> um, but one thing to also note is that we're also created to work. That uh, In Genesis 2.15, um, it says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Mm-hmm. And I just want to touch on this real quick, that we've talked about this before, but work is... In the Bible is not meant, or like work in heaven, work in the Garden of Eden, work in heaven. It's not the work that we know. It's not the painful, oh, I got to go to work. Like, it's not like the, oh, this sucks. But like, it's enjoyable. Like, work is good. Um, and he, God created it to be that. Um, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared, prepared in advance for us to do. Um, and Colossians 3.23 speaks to both, both of these. Um, that whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not uh, for human masters. Yeah, I think there's a ton of stuff in there that you just said that we could spend some time unpacking. One of the ones that I have always found fascinating when reading through the Old Testament, we have to realize that the way the Holy Spirit was um, gifted and the way that the Holy Spirit 
existed among people was drastically different than we mm -hmm. know it today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So today we live on the other side of Pentecost, which you can read about in Acts 2. And at that point, God had poured out his spirit on all believers. So right now, if you believe in Jesus and you have faith in him, you have you can receive the Holy Spirit and he can indwell inside of you and you can live life partnered with him for the rest of your days. That's a promise available mm -hmm. to us. It wasn't a promise available to the people of the Old Testament or even while Jesus was walking on the earth because the Holy Spirit had not been poured out in the same way because Pentecost mm -hmm. hadn't happened yet. Not in that way, Acts 2 Pentecost. So it's fascinating when you read this story in Exodus and you see in these four chapters these specific people who are gifted the Spirit, mm -hmm. right? Because this we, we become very, it's normalized that people have the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, we live by the fruit of the Spirit. We see the mm -hmm. gifts of the Spirit, these kind of things. But back then, it wasn't normalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God's Spirit didn't dwell among the people because they were unclean. The only reason we can receive the Spirit is because we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and therefore, we can be clean temples. Our bodies can be temples, 1 Corinthians for the spirit to dwell in, but they weren't. Like mm -hmm. when God looked upon them, they were still offering their animal sacrifices to try to appease God, to try to offer the ritual um, cleansing. So these three, when they receive the Holy Spirit, it is it should blow our minds. And yeah. we should think, what? Like, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, what is happening mm -hmm. here? And exactly like you're saying, some of the first people to receive the spirit in the Old Testament, these three, they were given it to be creative. Yeah. Yeah. They were given it to build the temple, to to, to craft the tabernacle, to mm -hmm. to be part of God's creating here on earth. Yeah. Like that that's mm -hmm. insane. Mm -hmm. Like Moses has these interactions throughout Exodus with God, but he doesn't necessarily have the same indwelling of the spirit that these three get. Yeah. Right? He has interactions face to face. God God talks with Moses, but these three creatives, these three architects who will design and build and create, they get the spirit in a way. Many won't until Pentecost. Yeah. Some thousands years later. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cool. Super cool. And even to think of like the name, like Solomon, like his name and his renown comes from the temple that he built. Mm -hmm. That the beauty and splendor was like so great. Yeah. That when they built the second temple after the first had been destroyed, they said, "Oh, it's not as good as the first one." Mm -hmm. That it it was never as good as the first one with all of the beauty and splendor that it held. Yeah. Yeah. So all this pre-work just essentially is to tell you that creativity is important. Yeah. yeah. Right. God has created us to work in the way that we work in as creative beings who are made in his image, who are gifted by him to do the work as only we can do. You know, all three of us sit at the table as different people with different giftings. God has given us that creativity. But before we get too much farther, one thing I wanted mm -hmm. to chat about is what do you feel like are obstacles or opposition to creativity? Mm. Like mm -hmm. we we are we know we're supposed to work. Like you got to make a living. You can read in Genesis. You can see that you were created to work, but yet, oftentimes, work doesn't feel creative. Yeah. And I don't want to steal too much of the thunder from the rest of it. But what do we feel like are obstacles that stand in the way from people being creative where they're at? Yeah, I think one the first one that jumps to my mind is um, people often or some people can write themselves off as not creative. Mm. Um, so I have in my mind this idea of what to be creative looks like and I don't feel like I fit into it and so I just I'm not creative so then never try yeah no, to totally. that. one of the things I'm thinking about is and you can correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like our culture has traded creativity for productivity mm. yeah yeah that rather than do things new and different and creative We'll just do what works and we'll churn out products and we'll churn out results and we'll mm -hmm. do, we'll just do it. We'll get really good at it and we've become productive and we've lost creative yeah. means. Mm. And so I know what it means to fill out that project or to fill out that form. I know what it means to plan a service. I know what it means to, to make this meal. I know what it means to blank, blank, blank. Mm -hmm. And so we follow the recipe. We, we follow the rules. We do the thing. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, yeah. but in a lot of ways, it's maybe stifling our creativity. Yeah. yeah. It's taking what we get good at and instead of pushing the boundaries of like, okay, what's next? What can I do to make this different? It's okay. I know what this is. I know how to do it. Let's keep it the exact same and let's speed run it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how fast I can do it. Mm -hmm. So I can mm -hmm. build up the time that I have to do whatever else. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. if you do any of John Mark Comer's work with the ruthless elimination of hurry or Jefferson Bethke to hell with the hustle, those books and their work that they did showed how the assembly line that Ford instituted when making cars has radically shifted and changed our whole, our whole culture Yeah, that now we are all about productivity and how can we achieve the best results in the fastest amount of time. 
And they thought that that would free people to be more creative in their leisure because it would take them less time to do work. But in American society where capitalist is king, like we actually traded our leisure for more work and more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so again, the brokenness of work compounded on itself when we were supposed to be, hopefully the technology that we were experiencing would free us to do more of what we really enjoy in life has actually burdened us to do more of the work that feels burdensome. Is there any other reasons you feel like opposition, opposition to creativity? It's hard. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> like, it's part of my job. It's in my job title is being a creative, and it's hard. Like to open up to come up with ideas. Mm. Like even just being creative like takes time. And one of the things that I've noticed in myself that has helped me be creative is be bored. Mm. Get bored out of my mind. Like sit on the couch, look out the window, kind of bored. <laughs> and like that's what inspires me. Like there's, there's a room here in the church that's painted all white. It's the most boring. It's a storage closet. <sighs> I love walking in there cause there's nothing. It's a blank canvas. <laughs> like I'm like tons of ideas flowing in Yeah. because there's a, a place to be creative and, and because it's boring, there's nothing to look at. There's nothing exciting. There's nothing interesting. And so I have to create that on my own. Mm-hmm. And so I feel a lot of the times people say, okay, well, I'm not, I don't want to be bored. So that doesn't leave any space for them to be creative, to have an imagination. We stifle the imagination for the facts of just getting things done, like you said. Um, And so like we have smartphones, which of course can be great tools for imagination by Mm -hmm. getting to see like others work and be inspired in that way. But a lot of Mm -hmm. times they can also just completely crush our free time. We don't have to be bored anymore, which can be a huge, huge hindrance to our creativity. Yeah, and I just keep thinking of reasons. But one uh, one one pastor I heard say he said uh, cons- cr- constraints actually build creativity. Mm-hmm. So when you feel like you're limited, it forces you to get creative because mm-hmm. it's like, hey, you only have thirty minutes to do this project, and you're like, this project usually takes me an hour, right? And now you all of a sudden have to get creative on how am I going to do what we what you usually takes me sixty minutes. How am I going to do it in half the time? Mm-hmm. Or people when they're forced to do projects, it's like, hey, I usually have uh a thousand dollars in my budget to do this project but my boss is telling me i can only do it with 400 it's like oh or like imagine mm-hmm. at oasis we had to put on an event but we have a, a tight budget that that semester that quarter and it's like we only have half of what we usually have to throw the oasis carnival to end the year it's like now we got to cr- get creative mm-hmm. and so these constraints that we sometimes are forced into and other times you got to put on yourself mm-hmm. in order to be creative you know you could just pull up what's like the one website that is all the free stock pictures um, that There's you can, a ton. anyway, shutter shock. Yeah. Any of those, like yeah. you could pull up one of those and just like pick a picture, you know, but if you constrain yourself and say, you know what? No, I want to be creative within my own bounds. I'm not going to use that resource. Mm-hmm. You might have to actually go out into Brookings or go out into the foyer, yeah. you know, and take a picture that would work well for your project or your work. I just think yeah. something like that is interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I'll give one last thing and then we can keep moving on. I also think vulnerability. Sorry. Yes. You off. Nope. Good. You're good. <laughs> Creativity um, is vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. You make something, you're really proud of it and other people won't like it. And you're like, you're oh. going to get shot down and it's going to yeah. suck. Yes. Yep. Anyways, keep going. Um, but consumerism, something that absolutely ravages our culture is this consumeristic mindset of like, okay, what can I get from it? What is this feeding me? What am I taking from this? But the, actually the opposite of consumerism is creativity mm-hmm. that instead of taking out, we're, or instead of taking in, we're giving out mm-hmm. that is in turn, not, what I can get from this, it's what I can give from this. I mean, it, you can see it all throughout scripture that the the best way to experience a full life is to give. Mm-hmm. Like, totally. Give more than what you have and like you will find the fulfillment in that. Um, but yeah, if you're consistently fi- like struggling with that consumeristic mindset, it's going to be really hard to be creative. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. Let's keep rolling. That's super good. Um, so what does it just mean to create? Um, creation is the process of building, forming something, uh, for some reason and for some purpose, uh, just like God has formed us from the dirt or rib, um, to have a relationship with him, um, to experience his creation and for us to be able to spend eternity with him. Uh, another example can be used that just like a baker makes a cake to celebrate an event to be enjoyed by the people celebrating that there's intentionality in the creation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's the building, the forming up that people like, oh, I want to create the best life. I want to create my lifestyle or like, I want to build and form my life into be something. Like, 
would assume all of our goals as Christians would be to be formed and shaped, to be created in the likeness of Christ. Mm. Um, and so it just means just that, to gather together, to build up, to take pieces and put them together in a, in a way that builds something up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, slightly going back to the limitations of creativity is that creativity is not just art. Yeah. That a huge misunderstanding and why people say, oh, I'm not creative and count themselves out is because they're not artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing with creativity is that that you don't have to be. Creativity is not just limited to that. Um, That at this table here, there's three of us with three totally different perspectives on what it means to create. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, I do art and design. Brennan uses words and speaking and Jana uses music. Um, And so like just out of our lives, our jobs, our day to day, our week to week, what like how are we just creative in what we do so like explain what creativity looks like for you why don't you go first yeah i am not very good at creating from nothing Hmm. um so not good at writing songs that's just that kind of that type of creative to start from nothing is not something i'm skilled at but what i have found is i i am really good at taking something and building upon it Hmm. um, and making it better so whether that's how like I'll take a worship song and how you put it to the pieces together, how you engage other elements in the midst of it. Like that's creative in and Mm -hmm. of itself. I tell my worship team, we don't need to be copy and paste elevation worship. Like we get to be us. And that means that it looks different and we get to be creative in Mm -hmm. that. Um, And so that's one way I feel like I have learned to be creative because I used to think, I used to think I'm not creative person. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not good at starting from nothing. i very rarely have like an original thought (laughs) or an original idea. Um, But my mom actually gave me this book once it's called steal like an artist. And it talks about how all art is stolen from something else. Like Mm -hmm. nothing is truly 100% unique. It it's building upon something else. Um, And so I think that once I was able to realize that and to release the limits, then I was able to be like, okay, how do we make art out of this? But even sometimes, um, I think creativity and like artistic expression for me is doing things well Mm -hmm. is not settling for a mediocre, mediocre version of something, but how do we like actually do this well and be intentional and purposeful with how I do it? Cause every time I sing a song, it's new. That's a whole Mm -hmm. new piece of art, even if it's someone else's song. Um, but how do what I bring to it? How is that creative and unique? Yeah. The other day I was listening to a new album and I was sitting there thinking, how do these artists sit there and come up with 15 yeah. news? <laughs> yeah. Every right? time I think I have a thought, I'm like, oh, well, this song says that, and this song says that, and this and, song. And even like beats. Yeah. Like how many ways can you hit the keyboard, yeah. right? And how many ways can you use the drums? And like, mm-hmm. I just don't get how you, how everything's not like copyrighted. When you make a song, it doesn't just flag 12 other songs yeah. that sound not identical, but yeah. I just don't yeah. get it. That's like, why I'm always surprised when people are like, they stole this from that. It's like, there's not that much any options things are going to sound alike <laughs> yeah <laughs> but Crazy. you want to go anyway yeah um so when it comes to me for art and design i see um just an intentionality in the way that things are prepared and the way you make things to communicate something um to me art and design is all about storytelling like and that is one of the things i'm most passionate about it's just telling stories um and so when it comes to anything from like doing film like making a movie um, to like creating a graphic. So like I make all the sermon graphics for Oasis. Like I put intentionality into, okay, what story can this tell? How does this supplement what is going on? Like how can I take what I know is going to be shared and come alongside that and co-labor with it? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's just something about art. Um, Timothy Keller in his book, uh, Making Sense of God, one of his first arguments, it's like for the God, it's like an apologetics book. And one of his first arguments is that art is too deeply spiritual to have mm-hmm. no like spirit behind it. Like art is a mm-hmm. great explanation for God. Like um, I always, I sound like a probably a broken record when I talk about this, but I always look to the Sistine Chapel. Like everybody knows about the Sistine Chapel, one mm-hmm. of the most beautiful pieces of art. Um, and it was created out of like faith. It tells the story of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you go to a ton of old chapels, like they're built with beautiful architecture. The mm-hmm. painting is so immaculate. And so it's done with a deep intentionality. Um, and 
and oh now I'm gonna blank on his name. Um it's uh the um Will we be able to help you yeah, if you have context? Know. Know. Yeah. It's an artist. Michelangelo. I think <laughs> one of them, yes. It oh. is. I gotta look it up. Like a famous artist? Yeah. I I don't Picasso. Vincent Van Gogh. That oh, guy. Oh, I was yeah. gonna get there. If you gave me one yeah. that was my yeah. third guess yep. if I was going for yep. it. Um Vincent Van Gogh, amazing painter. Like you Starry Night guy, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Starry Night guy. Shout out Starry Night. Before he was an artist, before he was a painter, he was in ministry. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so he created out of his faith. Yeah. He went from ministry to telling people about Jesus in ministry and he went into art. Mm -hmm. And he started to tell story through art. Yeah. And, and so I just think it's so awesome mm -hmm. that there are so many stories to tell and we get to tell the greatest story of all time. So, yeah, that's good. And we, d we tell you all of this because this is what it looks like for us to be creative at our jobs, Yeah, right? Yeah. And so as we're reflecting on what it means for us to be creative, hopefully you're reflecting on what it could look like for you to be creative. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you some ideas here in the future or in a little bit. But for me, obviously, one of the things that I consistently do is speak. And so uh, on Sunday nights, I'm trying to communicate a truth, right? Mm -hmm. There's It's always something that needs to be pretty simple for people to walk away with. So sneak peek, we're doing a series in a month that'll be brand new. And my main thought for that is not, don't follow your heart, right? That's what I'm going to try to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I just told you that in five words, right? Yep. Four, it's a contraction. <laughs> so don't is actually two words, but I told you that so simply, but if I just showed up on a Sunday night and said, well, don't follow your heart. It's like, wait, what, what does that mean? What does that yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. How do we explain that? Why, why does he say that? Like many of you right now are probably like triggered and like, no, I, what? you gotta have <laughs> some explanation in it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the sermon or the communication process. Or even if you were sitting in a meeting, the thing you're trying to communicate has a backstory and it has creativity in it, even as you communicate it. Mm -hmm. Simple truths have deep background that need some weight to go behind it, to be able to push forth the truth. So for me, one of the things that I, I talk about sermon writing as um, like doing a puzzle. So essentially it looks like this. I spend my first, I don't know, two to four hours taking and finding different pieces from different biblical passages, from different commentaries, from different authors or pastors, whatever it is. So there's this huge like acquisition of knowledge that I'm trying to take in. And I now have all my puzzle pieces laid out on the table. But in the process, the thing that if you ever do puzzles, you know, you got to look at the box. Most people, you need the box to be able to tell you what you're building. In my idea, God is the one who has the picture of the puzzle. He's the one holding the box cover. And so I must rely on the Father to be able to put this puzzle together. But the way that we work in tandem, me with the, with the Father by the Spirit, is a creative process of how can I take this wealth of knowledge that I've just accumulated and build it into something that will engage people and teach mm -hmm. them the truth I'm trying to communicate. So that by the end, I hope there's a beautiful puzzle that's been put together that gives us a picture of what God is trying to teach us. So again, even in that, it's like there's creativity on, okay, I have this point about this and this point about this, but how can I fit those together and which story and which example and which illustration is going to help glue all that together? And that's a creative process, even yeah. if it's just with words. Mm -hmm. I'm going to explain one more thing for you because I think it's great and I love it. Okay. But one thing that goes beyond just the prepping for Brennan is the actual preaching, the speaking of. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That there's always, you know, the emotional speeches that you find on Instagram that's got like the, the super dramatic, like musical, like piano behind it that's supposed to like bring about feeling. It comes the same thing with speaking mm -hmm. that the, the way that you choose your words and, and the way that you explain, the way that you uh, change the dynamics of the way that you speak, where you get really big and to really try to emphasize a point and then you get like really soft and really quiet to, to just get that like mm -hmm. deep depth. Like it all flows that, that there's a musical sense through the way that we talk. So like if you mm -hmm. put music behind someone talking, it makes sense because the pauses, the, the lifting up of the voice, the lowering of voice, the oh, changing cool. of tone, mm -hmm. it yeah. flows with the music, which is something that we are so prompt. Like music runs our lives. All y'all Spotify raps be up there in the thousands of minutes <laughs> yeah. of listening. So like we are so keen to listen to music. Mm -hmm. So when our voice flows, it, it does it in that way. And it speaks yeah. in a way from the dramatic pause to the rushing and building uh, of of words that is a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful art. Yeah. 
Yeah, even the way you choose to make your sentences and have conversations exactly. and somewhat creativity. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, yes, I understand that all three of us work in ministry. And so when we talk about creating things for God, it's super easy for the three of us to say that, yes, our creativity in our life points to God because mm-hmm. we work for God in the church. There's air quotes around that. But for those of you that don't work in ministry. Yeah, the 98% mm-hmm. of you. Yes. Yeah. There's still like a ton of meaning behind it. This is not mm-hmm. just for us that we like to put up the, the barrier of secular versus sacred that maybe you're saying, oh, because you're in ministry, it's easy for you to, for, to work for God or you're not in my position busting tables at Perkins or, mm-hmm. you know, stocking shelves at Walmart. Like I can't be creative in that space or since I'm in ministry, I can't, you know, whatever. And we would argue that that's not the case, that one thing that we can gather from Genesis 1 that is a little tidbit of creation that we didn't talk about yet is that creation is the process of taking disorder and bringing it to order. Mm -hmm. That uh, Genesis 1, 2 says, now that the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word formless in Hebrew, it's uh, pronounced tohu, um, it means chaos or confusion. I think you meant tofu. Not tofu. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, but tofu means chaos and confusion, the disorder that was found about in the creation um, when the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And so God took the chaos, the confusion, this, the disorder that was found in, in creation, and he brought it to order. That as you read through the creation account, you can see that God create these things and he calls them good because they have been brought to order. And so creativity is, isn't limited to art. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the process of, of creating uh, order from disorder. And so it's not limited to, to ministry either. This can be found in our everyday lives. Um, mm-hmm. One of my favorite examples is one of my buddies. He, he works in finance. And so he, he spends his life in Excel. Yeah. <laughs> but I think he's probably one of the most creative people I know. That by his work, he, he arranges numbers in ways I could never understand. Totally. He mm-hmm. takes them and he puts them together and he makes sense of them that he creates algorithms and and processes and equations that that form and shape these numbers into readable data, mm-hmm. which is something I could never do. And that's what he does like for his job and so I think he's like one of the most creative people I know. Oh, totally. Yeah. Again, uh, another guy I had in my uh, small group this year, he built houses. And we had this conversation as we worked through Genesis 1 during one of our small groups. And he said, he legit had a slight epiphany in, in small group. He said, I build houses for a living and I never thought about that. Mm. That I take nails and pieces of wood and I form them and shape them into someone's house where mm. they live and where they dwell. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And where there's deep experience with family, relational connection, like where there is shelter, where there's like comfort. And so we get mm. to do that in any of our spaces. And again, also not limited to work that we can do it in our lives. Yeah. Well, I want to say before we move on to some of that, I keep thinking about how everything we do tells a story. Yeah. Um, so you can, uh, for instance, for your job, you could slap a title on a white background and call that, here's a title for the series. Um, or you can tell the story and how you do it. And the same thing is for in whatever you do, how you work your job at Perkins tells a story Mm -hmm. to yourself and to the people around you. Mm -hmm. Um, And as Christians, if we want um, to continue to live lives that reveal who Christ is to the world around us, everything we do will tell a story about who God is. Um, And so how you do it can be and should be creative, even if it's following the exact steps. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, your friend who works in finance, he has rules he has to follow, but how he does it in the way that he creates is creative Mm -hmm. in and of itself. And so you can be creative in literally any and every aspect of life. Yeah. And just talking about life, I, Mm -hmm. I think one of the things we're thinking about here is when we move beyond just the bounds of work, one of the places where creativity is often stifled and we can miss it is in our friendships, mm-hmm. right? I think a lot of people in college or or I saw it a lot, even probably in high school where people are bored in their friendships, mm-hmm. that you do the same thing Friday, Saturday, 
you you do the same thing every week. You do the same thing with your friends. You get together. You eat food. A lot of a lot a lot of people who are cultural they they go out. They drink. They and it's the same. Just rinse and repeat every single day, every single weekend. Especially if you live in Brookings. Yeah, but that's like people. People yeah. are like Brookings is so boring. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But there's something about creativity that we can bring to our friendships. When you see the friends on Instagram who are going viral because they do all the crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they go to Walmart and they spend 15 bucks buying supplies, and then they put together this craft statue. And you're like, man, that is so awesome. <laughs> You could do that too. Yeah. They're just putting in the creative effort to do that. You know, it's like, oh, we're just going to show up and we're going to play an, a board game. Or you could get creative and you could make a new game and you and your friends could play that. Mm-hmm. Or like, hey, we're going to have a movie night. Or you say, let's be creative and everybody bring your favorite snack and we'll do a potluck movie night. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, rather than just sitting there watching Endgame for the 14,000th time, there's some <laughs> level of creativity that you brought to it that has enhanced your experience with friends. Yeah. But we get so stuck in the routine and we say, well, my friends are just boring or my life is boring or just this is just what we do yeah Mm -hmm. we get in that productivity mindset this is just what it is yeah Yeah, and that's okay like if you can if you're content with it but if you're looking and longing for something more Mm -hmm. how do you bring creativity to your friendships Mm -hmm. how do you bring creativity to your conversations right one of the things that my wife and i are always joking about is who asks each other how your day was first when we sit at the dinner table it's like we cook dinner we sit down it's just the two of us in our house sitting there by ourselves and the first question one of us will always ask is, well, how's your day? Like, I haven't seen you for six hours. How would you do? And well, I sat at my desk and I wrote a sermon and I talked to this person. It's like, I do the same thing every single day. And she sits at her desk and she works at her computer and she had a meeting. It's like, but that's, if that is always the, the extent of our conversation, life gets really boring really quick and you start yeah. to lose the infatuation and the, and the love and the, the relationship in a lot of ways. But that models some of our friendships too. It's like, well, how's your significant other. Mm-hmm. How was class? How was work? Okay. Well, we checked the box. We had a conversation and now we're out. Mm-hmm. We're getting creative is one of the things that I didn't do great last year, but was one of my 2022 New Year's resolutions that I did okay at was asking one creative question every single day. So I would ask questions like, if you had to star in a movie, which movie would it be? Right? Just <laughs> stupid stuff. Yeah. It's like, okay, if you could only eat one fruit for the rest of your life, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Because my wife and I, we know a lot of stuff about each other. So mm-hmm. I don't need to sit there and ask, like, hey, what's your brother's name? It's like, I know you brother, right? <laughs> like, like, it's not like we're dating. We've gotten past all of that stuff. So now it takes an extra level of intentionality and creativity mm-hmm. to have these conversations. And it's hilarious how you start talking about how what, what character you'd be in the latest Top Gun movie and what that plays into and what you learn about each other and just mm-hmm. the fun that brings to conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's super good. Also, going back to the telling stories. We each have our own story, and especially like we talked about it, your testimony, like we did that a couple of podcasts ago um, that you should go watch. But how can you to- tell your story with excellence that, mm-hmm. you know, when you sit down uh, like at Cool Beans and you're getting together with someone from a small group and say like they ask you, so what's your story? And you're like, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Like, what does it mean to tell your story in a, in a creative and excellent way? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you've been given a life to live tell something about it like you have the opportunity to share your experience you have the opportunity Mm -hmm. to say like i've been through this this is what i've gone through this is where i'm at right now and this is where i want to go and you get the opportunity to share that yeah so what does it look like to share that creatively that's good that's super good so people go out there and be creative yeah in your work in your friendships in your relationships be a creative person yep (laughs) all right that's it creative way to end da 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 Goodbye! Wow. (laughs) Okay. Okay, bye. (laughs)